Well, welcome again, and uh, we are now starting to record. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Fire Rescue's Emergency Services Academy. Uh, we're having an education night, special one, something different, uh, from Tesla uh, about electric vehicles and certainly about first responders. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Joshua uh, and Mike. Uh, they are Joshua's from Australia, but Mike's come from the US to actually talk about uh, first responders, so we do appreciate him coming over to his uh, to, to talk about that. Uh, so no further ado, uh, here's Joshua from Tesla. Thank you. So a little quick introduction, so kind of what is Tesla, um, what it's all about. Um, then we'll go to Mike for first responder sort of training and uh, looking at uh, vehicle fire uh, events. Then we'll have a Q&A at the end, about 30 minutes for that one. And then uh, we'll have to walk around the, uh, the SCX and the three uh, CM front there. Um, so the, the question sort of begins is why does Tesla uh, exist? So it really began with sort of this style of graph. Um, Skyrocking CO2, um, we know it's man made, we all understand the climate science behind it, um, and it was a, there's a need for a solution. So, Tesla was formed um, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Um, very simple mission, but obviously fairly complex uh, when it comes to changing society. But yet, uh, how are we going to do that? Um, first up, we're going to build uh, some really cool cars. So, we start with the Roadster, which is sort of the proof of concept. Uh, for the electric vehicle, uh, going to mid volume, uh, so like more sort of premium, awesome tech, Model S and Model X, uh, which is where we get a lot of our uh, sort of learning from. So, learning, developing, getting uh, through to the high volume, which is the Model 3. Um, so, we've got yeah, the S, the X, and the 3 sitting out the front today. We need to get on sort of shake up the model, we need to get on do this quickly, um, so we can really rely on uh, going through sort of dealers and other automotive suppliers and make the rest of the world change, and have to do it ourselves, so vertical integration is key. So raw material comes into Tesla, a bunch of stuff happens, and then we get some uh, finished goods out at the end of that one. Speaking of technology, um, tech is a pretty huge focus, obviously we're a sort of tech company. Um, safety is a major priority, uh, so if we look at what goes into making these vehicles. Um, our vehicles start out like, with the intention of being electric vehicles. They are not a vehicle that was originally designed for internal combustion and then modified to suit. They are built up around that. That gives us a certain uh, number of advantages, particularly around the structure, uh, when we look at uh, crumple zones and strength and so forth. Um, going through electric all-wheel drive and Tesla autopilot, so effectively starting with how we protect the, um, the uh, passengers in the event of an accident, all the way through to how we prevent the accident in the first place. We're doing all this learning, so we need to go and figure out how to keep improving. So instead of sort of building a vehicle and then that's it, um, we look at the data. So every vehicle is connected. Um, every night they'll send us the data from what they've done during the day, and then when they wake up in the morning, they'll tell us how well they slept. Um, so we'll take that information, we'll use it, we'll find faults, we'll find issues across the fleet, we'll go and fix firmware, software, and push that out on a, every two to four weeks. Well, uh, run fixes. Um, so sort of that all sounds a bit geeky, um, but this is sort of a, a what the data actually looks like. So if I was to go to Garmin or TomTom Tom or those guys and grab their data, that's on the left. Tesla's data is high precision mapping on the right hand side of that. So, and this is kind of an example of where we use such data. So continually developing, improving with the goal of eventually getting to full self-drive capability. Going back to why we sort of change the model, we need to go and get these cars out to customers, trade those middlemen. Um, so high traffic retail, uh, so looking at things like uh, retail centers within shopping centers uh, where people already are, um, direct customer sales, uh, and then the unprecedented, unprecedented brand loyalty. So you know, like I mentioned at the start, we've got really cool cars. So, uh, infrastructure, uh, we've got retail stores, service centers, and a charging network. Uh, obviously, if we need to change people over to drive electric vehicles, they need to have somewhere to charge it, so we figured we'd solve that problem too. This is what that solution looks like. We've got superchargers, uh, home destination, and then charging adapters. So, charging adapter, if you are um, anywhere with a 10 amp plug, you can take the 
cable out of the back of the car and plug it in. Um, home and destination charging is what most people are used to using, so when you park at home, same as you do with your phone, you just go and plug it in overnight. Um, and then you've got superchargers. So superchargers will help you get from like uh, long distances uh, and recharge your vehicle in that sort of 30 to 45 minute sort of time frame. So while you stop to grab lunch or uh, go to the bathroom, your car's recharging. This is what that uh, network looks like. So you read the numbers there, I won't sort of worry about calling it out. We're pretty much everywhere that the major population um, of both Australia and the internet is. Then the next part is that everyone sort of goes, well, your energy generation is uh, coal and hydrocarbon anyway, so how are you going to fix that? Well, this is where Professor Energy comes in. So we're looking at um, storing energy, so this is the power wall and power pack, and then Giga Factory is we're going to use all these lithium ion batteries, how are we actually going to find somewhere to build uh, or make that many batteries? Um, so if we look back, I think it was like 2013, there was, of all lithium ion batteries in the world, it was like 24 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt hours per year. Um, we're on track to do 50 this year, so yeah, a hell of a lot of batteries. Um, WP Solar, you guys know this, go outside during the sunshine. Um, Part of the idea with solar, um, so while you guys are sitting here, if we were here during the day, um, your house would be at home charging up the battery. So when you come home, back fully charged, you use that energy to run your house um, or charge your electric vehicle. Power pack, this is sort of a uh, grid stabilizing type technology, it's scalable, you can use it in uh, like micro grids. So we've got a few, uh, like uh, French Pioneer, I think it's uh, completely uh, offline for a really handy diesel generators. We turn them over to electric and solar. Uh, got like three days of energy backed up. So awesome, awesome stuff. It is possible, it is scalable. Um, this is the future we want. So you generate it, you store it, and then you use it for your car. So we've kind of got there. We've built some really cool cars. We've got the solutions for um, you know, generating energy and storing it and using it. Um, what's next? So we've got part two of the plan. Um, solar storage continues, so that's gonna be looking at uh, tiles and panels. Um, You've got the expanded all major vehicle segment. So if you've seen the Model Y announcement recently, um, that's expanding into the largest growing segment uh, globally, uh, the small SUV. Um, you will also see some of the notices around the pickup truck. Uh, we've got those coming as well at some point. Uh, full self-driving development. If you ever want to look at something really cool, have a look at the uh, Investor Day video we did around full self-drive and what Tesla's capabilities are. It still blows my mind every time I watch it. And the last one, a car that makes money for you. So have you, has anyone heard of robo taxis? Yeah, yeah. a few nods. If you haven't, you should, like, you will soon. Anyway, that sort of comes to the end of my bit. So just a quick little run through who we are, what we do. Go hand over to uh, Mike Connell. He's our technical ambassador of emergency response. Um, it is Mike's first time in Australia, so uh, let's give him a big hand. If anyone else walks in the door, they gotta sit in that row right there. Come on down, don't be afraid. <laughs> I don't bite. Um, I think I smell okay too, so I use deodorant. So, hi, my name is Mike McConnell. As mentioned, technical ambassador, emergency response for uh, Tesla Motors, so our Tesla, and I cover all of our vehicles, uh, some of the energy product as well, and work with other individuals on a lot of a lot of really cool stuff and also various other things when things happen. So. Uh, a lot of my stuff I'm going to present is coming right off the internet, which is actually pretty awesome because all this is available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. As long as you have internet access, boom, you can go to tesla.com and you can get to our first responder page. You have access to our first responder guides, first responder sheets, and also a place called YouTube. We have videos out there. We have vehicle extrication videos that we're gonna talk about. And we also have an electric vehicle firefighting video that we put together using a, a real functional Model S that we set on fire and then put the fire out and show the whole process for taking care of that. So we'll start here on, on our page, tesla.com. When you get to that page, you click on this little, little bar over here and we click, we click on support. 
right? Uh, says uh, select your regions. For tonight's presentation, we're gonna be using the page for the United States, because right now the United States page has all three vehicles on it, whereas the Australian page does not yet have the uh, Model 3 on it. And when we go down to the bottom of this page, find a little thing called contact. Click on that. And right here we have first responders. We're gonna click on that. Or like I have go. So yeah. that's oh perfect. There you go. Yep. Uh, Tesla.com slash first responders. That's actually my alarm in the morning and stuff. It's like, oh, time to wake up. What time is it in America? I have no idea. So Tesla.com slash first responders, which is this page right here. And then another important address is first responder safety at Tesla.com. Now that second one, first responder safety at Tesla.com, that's an email address. That email comes directly to me. And I correspond with people from all over the world when they ask questions about our vehicles. A lot of times I get simple stuff, but sometimes I get more complex questions. And I'm more than happy to answer whatever question you have about any of our products and such. If I don't know an answer, I'll reach out to other people and I'll definitely get that answer for you and everything. So after this class, 24 hours now, 24 days from now, come up with a question, hit me up at firstrespondersafety at tesla.com. There will be a quiz later about those, so hopefully everyone's paying attention. Now on this first responder page, what you'll find as we scroll down, we'll find our vehicles. Uh, something that's just added recently was emergency response guide for the supercharger. So that's uh, located right here. Hopefully in, uh, you know, within the next six months, we'll have more first responder guides out here for additional product like stationary storage, mm -hmm. power wall, et cetera. Today we're gonna start on the Model S and we're gonna start with the quick response sheet for the 2016 to present vehicle. Okay, what we have here is our quick response sheet. So on this emergency response sheet, it's a two page document. It is a PDF document. You can uh, download it and save it. You can also print it as well. And so on your, your vehicle, you can have a, a copy of it, or if you have some uh, computer on board, you can put that on there. Again, all this information is available for you to use. So if you're gonna put together maybe a training presentation, you're more than welcome to use any material that we have available on the website and such. And if you're looking for permission, then I, Mike McConnell, give you permission to use our material in your training program. If you've got any questions on anything, hey, hit me up at First responder safety at tesla.com. Because this information, this information is for you. We're one of the few manufacturers, I'm gonna say we're the only manufacturer that has a first responder site that you can easily click to and get all this information without going through 2,400 different steps to get to it. I know Mercedes, they don't have this on their website. So uh, BMW, I don't think they have it on their website. General Motors, I don't think they have it on their website. Uh, you can do some random Google searches and find stuff, but they don't have on their actual web page a dedicated page just for first responders. So we have this information available for you to help you out when something uh, when something goes goes wrong, potentially wrong out there in the field. At the top, we have the different views of the vehicle. So we have the front front side of the vehicle, we got side vehicle picture, and we have a rear vehicle picture. Now, these images right here highlight the very important things you need to know about on the vehicle. For example, on the hood and on the rear lift gate, we locate where we have our lift cylinders, where they're located at. Now, on the Model S, it can have a manual lift gate, it can also have an electric lift gate. So if it's an electric lift gate, this cylinder on this side is gonna be, it's gonna be larger because it has an electric motor inside there that allows that to open up, be motorized. Looking at our side view here, you can see those lift cylinders. Also, we have our airbag inflation cylinder located right here. This does have a side curtain airbag on the Model S, so it does come down. So when you're doing any kind of extrication operation on the vehicle, again, the usual operation, peel and look, try to find, locate that cylinder so we don't end up cutting through that cylinder. Also, we can see the location of we have our seatbelt pretensioner located right there. That's gonna be 
towards the bottom of that bead pillar. The bead pillar is made out of high strength steel. Now, the vehicle itself is made out of aluminum. Now, I apologize for not speaking the Queen's English, so if I don't say aluminum, yeah, it's because I come from the other side of the pond, and uh, yeah, we never got the Queen's English in school, so yeah. So we have the aluminum structure of the vehicle with some high strength steel thrown in there for additional protection. So high strength steel is located in this V pillar. Also in our doors, we have reinforcements as well. Now, right below this V pillar, you're gonna see this big long orange line. This is a high voltage battery pack. That battery pack actually sits underneath the vehicle. All right, so on top of that battery pack, of course, you have a cover on top of that pack, but on top of that is the vehicle floor. So the interior floor, and then you have the battery pack right underneath it. Now, one thing that we always say, never push off of that floor with any kind of extrication tool, hydraulic ram, or anything like that. Reason for that, that floor is not that <coughs> thick, so it's really not designed to support that additional uh, force being applied to it. But you can push off of the sill. The sill on this vehicle, or we call it Stace the Rocker, it's about as big as my head, it's massive. It's big aluminum extrusion, and it's extremely strong. And you'll see in the extrication video that hydraulic ram is put on there, and they're using that in order to do the dash roll. So extremely strong. Floor, it's not designed to be pushed off on, so we wanna make sure we never push on that because we aren't preventing any kind of damage to the top of the battery pack from anything being forced onto it. Also in orange, we have our front drive unit, rear drive unit, charger, this is the cable that goes to the charge port. And then on the other side of the vehicle, on be the driver's side of the vehicle for you, we have the high voltage cable that runs through that, that sill or that rocker. Again, that rocker is it's, it's massive. Have, it's an extrusion just like on uh, your toothpaste. Who brushed your teeth today? Everyone brush your teeth today? Yeah. Hopefully all the hands go up. Yeah. Hopefully everyone washed their hands too. Yeah. But when you squeeze that tube of toothpaste, you have a nice cylinder. Of toothpaste that comes out. That's an extrusion in a simple way. For this, hot aluminum gets forced through a die, and then you end up with this really cool rocker that we use on the car. Not only does it provide strength for you to, to use a ram to push off of, it provides, provides protection to the side of the battery pack in case there's a side impact. And we do, do, we do uh, uh, pole testing when it smashes into the pole to see how deep it goes. And I've seen it go actually pretty deep, and that pack is still protected from the side impact. So again, extremely strong. And what are you going to talk about? What sort of voltage do you use? Oh, we're going to get there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but to answer your question, battery pack has 400 volts in it. Okay. So yeah, and uh, we'll talk later about going into like state of charge and everything and how that relates okay. to that voltage on that pack. Yep. Yeah. As you can see in the picture, that battery pack does take up the entire floor of the vehicle. All right. So from wheel well to wheel well, we have that. In our picture, we also see our first responder loop. So first responder loop is located on the driver's side. So here in Australia, it's located on the driver's side for Model S and Model X. Model 3, a little bit different vehicle, it's going to be located on your passenger side. All right. That first responder loop, it does two things. When that first responder loop gets cut, we're taking away 12 volt power going to the airbags. We're also taking 12 volt power going away to the contactors. The contactors are located inside the battery pack on this back side. Those contactors are basically like a light switch. When the light switch is turned off, you have voltage that's going to that switch. When we turn that light switch on, the lights come on, which is pretty awesome. With these contactors, when the contactors are off, all the energy is stored inside the battery pack. All right. Again, we have uh, 18650 cells that are inside there. Anywhere from 6,000 to 9,000 uh, little cells are inside there, and all those have stored energy on. So when we close those contactors in the back of the pack, that then allows that energy from the pack to go to our drive units, uh, go to the PTC heater, which is our cabin heater on the vehicle, and any other high voltage components on that vehicle itself. Contactors open, we no longer have power going to those components. So again, 
Our first responder loop takes out the 12 volt power going to the airbags, also takes out 12 volt power going to those contactors. Now, when we have an accident, that's where we want to cut that first responder loop. Again, if any airbags haven't deployed, by taking that 12 volt power away from those airbags, that's going to keep them from deploying on you. All right. We have a really cool extrication video on the Model S. Again, our videos are out there on YouTube. This is the beautiful Fremont, California factory where the Tesla Model S, Model X, and the Model 3 are manufactured. That's aluminum. It's going to get stamped out into a body panel. We're going to skip through a bunch of the talking and everything. We're going to go to the good stuff. All right, right here we have a vehicle being stabilized. Well, what's super important on the vehicle is that we don't poke anything up against the battery pack. We don't poke anything through the battery pack. That bottom of the battery pack, it's an aluminum plate, about three quarters of an inch or so. I'm not quite sure what that is in, uh, in millimeters. I think. But it's fairly thick. When we stabilize the vehicle, we want to be on the outer sill of the vehicle because that's where, that's where that, that big rocker is at where we can actually support that vehicle. There are also some lift points. There's four of these lift pads located on the vehicle. This is a plastic cover that covers up that big aluminum sill on there. These cars really don't like going on their sides. Uh, they stay fairly flat. Most of your weight, uh, center of gravity, is on the bottom of the vehicle. So the pack itself, I think we're about 1,600 pounds wet. And uh, weight distribution is about 50-50 on that vehicle. But customers, they do amazing things with our vehicle. And sometimes, yeah, it does end up on the side. But I've, I've only seen me. I've seen one in, from Europe uh, a year or two ago where somehow they hit a snow embankment and rolled the car over. <coughs> But they got out, wasn't a problem. It's really easy to find our videos. Just go to uh, YouTube and type in uh, Model S extrication video, Model X extrication video, Model 3 extrication video, and 99% of the time these are the top videos right up there. A lot of people check these out. This is uh, Brock Archer. Brock Archer and I, we've worked on a lot of these uh, videos together uh, since about 2011. We've been working together. All of our videos, we use actual firefighters in the videos. They're, uh, uh, there's firefighter groups that we work with to figure out the proper uh, cutting techniques we need to use on these vehicles. So we got input from the field. So it's not just a bunch of engineers sitting around saying, Huh, I wonder where we should cut that at. Yeah, we have the pros come in and tell us, hey, this is going to be a good place to cut here. Hey, what's this made of? And then we go from there. And somehow, not sure what happened. That's definitely not. Are you trying to skip your head? There we go. All right, so. Good stuff right here. Yeah, that's right. I draw a tool tearing a door off. Yeah. This is an aluminum structure on this vehicle. So the things you have to be careful of with aluminum is that you can easily, uh, it'll easily tear. Uh, doors can easily skin if not uh, treated properly. Who in here has worked on an aluminum vehicle? Anyone done any extrication training on aluminum? All right, let me have a couple, see some heads on and everything. Yep. Class participation is appreciated. So yeah, that'll keep me awake and everything, keep me going, yep. What we're uh, pointing out here after we, after we took this door off is on the Model S, right in this area on the early cars is the DC to DC. The DC to DC is basically our alternator. So we take 400 volts coming in, we drop it down, and then we charge our 12 volt off of that. So the car does have a 12 volt battery system. 12 volt battery system uses a chassis ground as like any other vehicle on the road. Our 400 volt system, which is our battery system, 
it actually uses what's referred to as a floating ground. Now on that floating ground, we have a thing built into that called high voltage interlock loop. Other electric vehicles use this as well. And with HVIL, what you have basically is you have a guy on a bicycle, and he rides around, he stops at each high voltage component, say, hey, how's it going? And he's like, hey, I'm doing great, all right, cool. Goes to the next high voltage component, hey, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great, huh? Yep, and he rides around, once he gets up to all of them, then he makes that same track again, and then he pulls up, hey, how are you doing? And then you're like, and then all of a sudden I don't hear anything, there's no response, and I ask again, hey, how are you doing? No response, so, ho, ho, we got an isolation fault, okay, we got a problem here, and boom, next thing you know, contactors are opening on it because the system has seen that there's not feedback coming from a high voltage component where there's supposed to be feedback coming from. So we open up the contactors, open up the high voltage circuit, and that then isolates all that high voltage to the battery pack itself. So while I was, I was chatting there, they uh, tore off the fender, and right here is a DC to DC. So early vehicles have DC to DC located here, and then uh, later models, it's located along the bulkhead right in the center. Uh, we don't call it a firewall because we're not allowed to use the F for it at work and everything, so we call it a bulkhead. And we relocated there for not only for safety reasons, but for uh, other uh, build reasons as well and also to keep it from a potential area where it could accidentally have a high voltage cable cut. That's why we tear that fender off so we can see what's there. We do a quick check on that. Right now Brock is doing a chokehold on that fender, so he's trying to uh, use his bare hands to break through it. It's not quite strong enough, so he's going to have firefighters come in with the uh, tools and cut. Actually what he's pointing out, he's pointing out relief cuts that have to be made in order to do a dash roll on the Model S. Again, it's a very strong vehicle, so there are some things that we have to do in order to get that vehicle to move. If you did not make these cuts, well, good luck, all right, because it is very strong. Sorry to make your opinion so much. Did you say that when the DC to DC, when the um, contactors are open, the DC to DC is dead? Yeah, DC to DC is not going to be doing anything. Okay. Yep. When the contactors are open, is there any live DC cables in the the vehicle or is it all in the battery pack? It's all going to be in the battery pack, yeah. Yep. So you say DC, DC, does that mean DC high voltage to DC low voltage? Is that mean correct? Correct, yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because we have uh, AC induction motors on the vehicle, so we actually, uh, on the drive unit itself, it converts the DC to AC in order to run that electric motor. Got yeah, the relief cuts in, up there in the A pillar. And now they're making in some cuts. Again, they're aware of that, that DC. DC is located there so they don't cut into it. And again, the reason why we're avoiding this, because at all times we want to treat any orange cable and any high voltage component as if it's live. Because in a real scenario when there's an accident, we have no guarantees. We design all kinds of safety into that vehicle so when an accident does happen, we try to isolate all the high voltage to the battery pack. But you never know what's going to happen in an accident. You can do lots of crash testing, but those customers, they have, they have amazing ways of doing things that we can't really simulate. So again, we're going to treat every, every orange cable as if it's live, every battery pack as, as if it's full energy, and any high voltage component as if it has high voltage going into it. Brock has pointed out that on some of the vehicles, they have a uh, dash tie down that's located there. Sometimes that dash tie down needs to be cut in order to do the dash roll. And again, when you watch the when you watch the video on your own time and everything, you'll be able to hear all the all the great dialogue taking place. Oh, uh, there we go. Yep, yeah. you're cutting down there where the dash is at. external on the bulkhead, yep. Yeah, here we go. 
right, so the hydraulic ram, and you see it's right there on that sill. Again, that sill is massive, and it can withstand a lot of abuse. Just rolling up that dash like it's no big deal. Now we get the spreaders in there. And it's a beautiful thing. I like to say one must die so others may live. So it's a perfect example. And you know, sometimes yeah, we cut up several, so several die so others may live. And then sometimes people cry when they see our car getting cut up. But it's all for a good cause. Check out the Model X. Model X, she's a completely different vehicle than the Model S. Yeah, there's some similarities, high voltage battery pack and high voltage components and such, but vehicle structure is definitely much different. All right, so Model X, also made out of aluminum as well. All right, now Model X is different because it has the famous Falcon door. Now, it's not called a gull wing door because a gull only has one hinge. A falcon has two hinges in its wing, so that's why we call it a falcon door. And it kind of opens up like this. It's got some cool sensors in it, so it can know if a car is next to it or, a, or something is there, so when it opens up, it'll know not to hit it. A lot of high technology built into that. What's special about that falcon door is the side curtain airbag. Side curtain airbag does not come from the top, it comes from the bottom, so it shoots up from the bottom up. So when you're, when you're checking things out, you need to remember that the cylinder is located down here in the door. So Falcon door, side curtain airbag shoots up. Front door, side curtain airbag shoots down. We have this massive B pillar on the Model X and you'll be able to look at it on the vehicle. It's extremely strong. There's actually a boron tube inside there. In our video, we show kind of a workaround, so, so you, you do not have to cut through that boron tube, because not all extrication tools out there can handle that extra, extra strong material. So right above the seat belt tension, there's a little sweet spot before that boron tube starts, and you should easily be able to make a cut there. Also in the video, you're gonna see a little workaround for the top piece as well. Now, if you have some of the latest and greatest uh, Hearst hydraulic tools, you should be able to cut right through that, and not, not a problem. Actually, on that boron tube, even Hertz with their big 799 tool that was designed after working on this Model X. It's got extra big cutters on it. When it starts to cut through that section of the boron tube, it starts to go in. And then it begins to load up a little bit. And then boom. And then it breaks, all right? That boron tube just snaps. Now, as a little kid, I wanted to be a special effects, sound effect person or anything, so I learned how to do all the cool noises. I have yet to replicate the sound of the boron tube breaking, so someday, you know, maybe next time you come to visit, I'll have that boron tube sound just right. So when you go through that, yeah, that is extremely strong. That is a very difficult place to cut on there, so always uh, use caution around that. On our, our windshield, A-pillar, we have this uh, it's a hydroform piece of steel that goes through there, so it's really strong, and it's designed to support that weight of that windshield. As far as I know, we have the largest windshield on any vehicle that's on the road today. It's amazing. You drive and look at the stars, have an autopilot, kick back and relax. Wow, this is beautiful. Now, that massive glass, you're wondering, ah, oh, is that laminated? It sure is. The windshield's laminated, the top glass on top of the falcon door is laminated, also the rear glass for the lift gates is also laminated glass as well. Side glass, just traditional glass that will shatter and break on that. We also have some reinforcements in the doors as well. On the Model X, so on the Model S, we had the chargers located underneath the back seat on the Model X. It's located in the rear quarter panel, so that's going to be the passenger rear quarter panel for your vehicles here. 
We have our front and rear drive units in orange. High voltage cables, again, they're gonna run through those sill. On both sides, you have, uh, have high voltage cables, excuse me, just on the driver's side, high voltage cables running through there. You also have in the cabin, you have what's called a PTC heater. This is where you get your cabin heat. Anyone have electric heat at home? A little baseboard electric heater and everything? Yeah? So we have electric heat that runs off of 400 volts. You guys got what, a 220 here? Yeah, yeah, so we got a 400 volt little tiny heater that does a really good job of heating it up. But the vehicles potentially could come with the rear HVAC unit. So back here, it could have rear AC and also a rear PTC heater. So you may have an orange cable that runs in the back of the vehicle. So that being like the trunk area, coming over to that heater box and HVAC box. First responder loop, located on the driver's side. First responder loop does what? 12 volt to the airbags, 12 volt to the contacts, correct. When we cut that, we're gonna take away 12 volt power going to the airbags and 12 volt power going to the contacts. Where are those contacts you're looking at? Battery. And battery, yeah. I was assuming such a fancy vehicle does the electric seat. Sure does, yes. So if we disconnect that loop, it's also isolating those seats as well for... Right? No, no it's, it's only doing the 12 volt power going to the airbags, 12 volt power is going to the contacts. If you disconnect the 12 volt battery, yeah, then you're gonna take out that, yeah. Now if the vehicle's been in an accident, boom, crash, bam, airbags go off and everything. Well, we got various other things built into that system so those airbags deploy, everything gets super excited and the, there's actually a pyrotechnic fuse on the fuse box and it blows and it's like, whoa! And then it's like, yeah, so then it begins to shut down a whole bunch of 12 volt systems on it and everything, so, so yeah. So when you get to the vehicle, it's, there's not 100% that we're gonna have 12 volt power. You may have it, you may not have it and everything. And also it kind of depends on the health of the 12 volt battery as well. And everything. Also big time uh, response time and such. So, uh, United States, you have national average about 15 minutes or so. Uh, in cities, it's about, uh, it's about five to eight minutes response time. So again, a lot of variables come into play on whether or not you're gonna have power going to those seats when you get there. And again, you have a 12 volt battery. That 12 volt battery uh, is located uh, up underneath the hood. There is a, a cover, uh, actually from the front that's inside there. There is a cowling piece that goes up there. Once that's taken away, you get access to that first responder loop on the vehicle. Also, to make note uh, for EDR data, the SRS module located in the center console. Uh, Model S located up front of the center console, right for the front of the center console and then on Model X, look at right in the center of that center console. Any crash data people in here? No? All right, perfect. But if you need to get access to crash data or whatever, uh, our website is edr.tesla.com and a whole bunch of information on that page. And when in doubt, just hit me up on the email address, first responder safety at tesla.com. some uh, great driving in this video. We used a uh, famous driver, born in Indiana, home of the Indianapolis 500. Kind of looks like this guy here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, all these uh, fancy road driving clips you'll see of this beautiful vehicle. Oh look, hey, there's me. I know these videos very well because I have helped create these videos. Got a little drone action going on there. That's Palo Alto, early time of the year when it's green. This time of the year it's all brown. I love that shot, that's great. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Right there we have a nice shot of our first responder loop. Located right underneath the cowl panel. Oh yeah. Now we got the good stuff. Sidewall removal. You 
these, fi these uh, firefighters are from Fremont, California, Fremont Fire Department. They're cribbing the vehicle, reaching in, making sure the vehicle is put in park. Breaking out the glass, cut the first responder loop. Uh, this vehicle is missing some items up front. This was a crash test vehicle. This is Randy Wells from the Denver Fire Department. All of our vehicles that we use in these videos are actual production level vehicles. So they're not uh, experimental vehicles or anything like that. They're all production level. <coughs> They all end up as an engineering vehicle at some point. And then after being an engineering vehicle, then we end up, uh, well, yeah, a lot of them end up being cut up like this. It's pretty awesome. Because you have to recycle the vehicles anyways. You can't, you can't put them back on the road. Now on that Falcon door, those, the, the Falcon door is open up. You have two electric struts that are there. And you'll see it out here on the the Model X that's located there. You got two big hinges opening up. You also have four big hinges that are located in the spine, two for each side. So in your garage door at home, unless you've uh, eaten uh, several bowls of Wheaties that morning and stuff, if your garage door is spring breaks, that door is extremely heavy to pick up and try to open. So when those springs work properly, it allows it to easily open up. And so those, those springs on top, also, same thing for the Falcon doors. Give that extra assist to open up the heavy door. The door latches located at the bottom. It's located right there on the bottom. Yep. So the top gets separated, that bottom comes down, and then you can easily take it off. Can you just push the top off? Yeah. Just push. Yeah, you can push or cut. So I've, I've seen I've seen people do both on it. Yeah, I believe the cutting is a lot easier. But then we cut depending on uh, potential damage to it. It may swing up rapidly or it may be real slow on opening. Here we're going to take out that B pillar. Here I'm going to part of the door again a little bit uh, better access. We're doing the uh, work around there on the top. Yeah, if you cut down down low where they're cutting here, because yes. they're uh, they're bypassing that boron tube. Oh, that okay. boron tube does not run all the way down to the bottom. Oh, okay. It runs about from here on up. Okay. Super important to on your tool placement. Always be aware of that whenever you're cutting on any vehicle. First actually developed a new tool to, in order to cut that bottom piece of the B pillar. Uh, they developed the 799, which has an extra large cutter on it, and they were able to cut that with one cut. Most of your tools, you have to do a double cut on that. In 2017, we provided two Model X's for our first cut up at FDIC in their booth. And then after that, they took the vehicle back, did some further testing, and then in 2018, they came out with that new cutting tool. And then in 2019, this year, we cut up a Model S, a Model X, and a Model 3 in their booth. And I have a little connection with Hearst, and that has to do with my dad. So when I was a little kid, my dad was in a really bad car accident. A dump truck drove over his car when he was on his way to work. He had a 1969 four-door Chevy Biscayne. Uh, it's late 70s, and the dump truck ran over, and so my dad's was pretty bad off. And so the local volunteer fire department was actually just right down the street 
from where the accident happened. And the fire department, they come down, they begin trying to look out over the vehicle, try to figure out. Uh, some of their fire trucks are former World War II trucks, so they end up pulling that dump truck off. And then as they're trying to figure out what to do with the individual in the car, my dad, he begins to, to come too. He becomes conscious and he starts recognizing the voices. And this volunteer fire department, my grandfather was a member of that volunteer fire department. My uncle was a member of that fire department. So as a little kid, I played in that firehouse on fire trucks all the time. So it became very personal because my dad started recognizing their names and talking to them. They're like, oh no, we know what this is. So Indianapolis Fire Department, they had just finished up training with the Jaws of Life tool. So someone on the, on the crew said, hey, let's call Indianapolis. And they bring out their tools. So Indianapolis brings out their Jaws of Life. And then my dad ends up being the first person in the state of Indiana to have the Jaws of Life used on him to get him out of the vehicle. As a little kid, it was cool because my dad was on all three TV stations. He was being interviewed. My dad likes to joke, and in 2017, we're, we're at FDIC cutting up the Model X, and my dad showed up, and he was telling his story to all the Hearst people. And uh, my dad jokes, he's like, had I waited a week, I could have had Jaws of Life and Lifeline Helicopter. So yeah, he could have had two firsts and everything. So. So it's, uh, it's quite an honor for me to, to give back to everyone. And I definitely have a little soft spot for hers because that saved my dad's life. So it's super important to me. So but all tool manufacturers out there, I always tell them, hey, you know, give me a call and everything. Let's work with your tools so you can develop a tool that will work on our vehicles. Because vehicles, they just get stronger and stronger every day. All the manufacturers are starting to build super strong vehicles and putting them on the road, which is great for the occupants. All right, let's talk about the Model 3. Model 3, she's a completely different vehicle compared to the Model S and Model X. Yeah, we got a high voltage battery pack. Yeah, we have electric motors, but she's made of steel. So a steel body with aluminum doors and aluminum hood. Model S and Model X, complete aluminum structure, minus a high strength seal located in the B pillars. Model 3, steel with aluminum doors and aluminum hood. A few uh, things that are different on the three. First responder loop, it's not on the driver's side anymore. It's located on the passenger side. So S and X, first responder loop located on the driver's side. Model three, located on the passenger side. And what does that first responder loop do? Cuts Yep, cuts 12 volt power going to the airbags, cuts 12 volt power going to the contactors. Probably picking up a theme here, right? Yep, that's right. <coughs> Do the airbags hold a charge at all after you've cut them? After you've cut that first responder loop? Yeah, it's like any of them. You know, you're gonna have probably about 30 seconds for that, for that capacitor dissipates that energy right. inside there. Yep. That secondary spot that tells what the Wi-Fi plug in. What was your question again? Wi-Fi can't plug in. Ah. Or in the charge, can it back charge through that power, that core? No, no. That's that's gonna be. A, that charge port's a completely separate circuit on that. Yep. So first responder loop located on the passenger side, uh, side current airbags, normal normal area, inflation cylinder. The whole vehicle, the whole the whole top of the vehicle is glass. Again, uh, we got laminated glass going up for a windshield, and then laminated glass and laminated glass in the rear of the vehicle. Uh, side glass, just your normal side glass, little little center punch, you can break it easily. Seat belt pretensioners located on here. Battery pack, again, that's the bottom of the floor on the vehicle. Underneath the back seat, all right, what's it? right below that cushion is the battery pack. So again, we don't want to push off on the floor, all right? Again, we can push off on the sills, but we can't push off on the floor to potentially provide damage to the battery pack. We don't want to do that. We want to take a safe situation and make it into a not so safe situation with the battery pack. Our SRS control unit located right there in that center console, right underneath it. Now on these sheets, there's, like I said, there's a second page that goes with it. We 
at the awesome topic of firefighting. Yes. Before we get to firefighting, let's look at Model 3. Get cut up. Again, another professional driver scene in there. Might recognize that person. Yep. If you can't get to the uh, first responder loop, is there a second way of isolating the battery? Now, the way that system is designed, there are there's many things in place so when an accident does happen, so if you cannot get to that, again, one thing we always assume is the high voltage cables are live, yeah. so we're never gonna cut through the high voltage cables. Yeah. And we also assume that our high voltage components are alive as well. But there's tons of safety that's built into that. So when the car is in an accident, yeah. there's multiple things that'll happen. And ideally that vehicle wants to, wants to isolate that high voltage battery pack to itself as quickly as possible. Right. Yep. Okay. All right, here we have a beautiful blue uh, Model 3. She's going to get cut up. It's a beautiful thing. Doing a, a door removal and dash displacement. They're cribbing the vehicle. Reached in, make sure the vehicle was put in park. Oh no, I forgot my keys. That's all right, we'll get the hood open. Yeah. Everyone should have some special tools on board to open up the hood or a door or anything. Gaining access to the first responder loop. Model 3 located outside, it's not as roomy because everything is in place on that vehicle. This place, was, this vehicle was one of the uh, few Model 3s we had available to actually uh, cut up. Just missing a few pieces. Yeah, we'll take the hood off, get it out of the way. Now he's going to talk about uh, gaining access by removing the fender and then also reaching in to cut, to cut the door off. That, that was Jim Bolton from the Reno Fire Department. Shoemaker, he's from Aurora, Colorado. Wilson's Fremont Fire Department. Pinching that fender to gain a little access. Put those spreaders in. Anyone use power tools to take fenders off or door hinges off or anything? Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. Again, so many different techniques out there. Recipro <coughs> reciprocating saw, sawzall, those work as well. Uh, one thing I'll point out, Model S, we did testing with uh, sawzall, cutting it up. Uh, yeah, it likes to eat blades like they're candy. So uh, we found, uh, found one brand out there, Linux, which was the one that held up the best. Uh, the Milwaukee's, the Diablo's, the DeWalt's, some of the other ones. Yeah, those, uh, those burned up pretty quick and uh, those little teeth disappeared pretty quick. Again, it's a really strong vehicle, so strong aluminum. They're cutting on that bead pillar, high strength steel in there as well. Stabilizing the door with that strap. Again, Model 3 has aluminum doors. The actual structure on the vehicle is steel. The hood and the doors are made out of aluminum. Just the steam will be until that door. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, the, the entire door, yep. And being aluminum, if the tool gets in the wrong position, could easily just skin that door as well. <clears throat> And of course, the big design that we work on is the vehicle being able to be crushed to the front and rear and the doors actually open up without having to be cut open. But of course, every accident is going to be different. Doing the old 
little peel and look technique, trying to find that inflation cylinder so you'll cut through it. You're gonna have to make a few relief cuts in order to do a dash roll on this vehicle. Little opening that's right there, perfect for the spreaders to get in, in there to make a larger opening. Silent Film Festival. The black and white movies from the old days, like Laurel and Hardy. That A pillar structure, the way it's designed, is it's massive and it's designed, it's super strong. And again, that's to protect the occupants and also down below to protect the battery pack as well. Fair making some relief cuts. We did some, did some testing a week ago. Uh, so a couple firefighters from New Zealand were there in California, right here. So the Fremont Fire Department training facility. We cut up a Model S, a Model X, and a Model 3. On the Model 3, we did a test, not making the relief cut to see if we could do a dash roll. And yeah, that uh, you definitely need to do those relief cuts, we discovered. got to a point where it pretty much kind of stopped, and then once we made those relief cuts, then we were able to roll it completely up. When you say the vehicle isolates itself if it's been in an accident, does that uh, change your ability to put it in the park or put a handbrake on? No, because that, that's based off the 12 volt. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you have 12 volt power and everything, and again, if there is an accident, the vehicle will automatically set the parking brake on the vehicle. So you know, it's just a redundant check that's being done on it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah as long as you have 12 volt power, you can do it. Uh, and also someone had asked uh, previously about a uh, 12 volt power for, for moving, the, moving the seats on the vehicle as well as the power <laughs> seats. Yeah, as long as you don't take out 12 volt power or as long as 12 volt power doesn't fail on the vehicle and you have a healthy 12 volt, then you'd be able to still move those seats as well. Again, every accident's gonna be completely different. So yeah, we never really know what we're gonna come up to until it actually happens. And that's why, you know, if you get one of these, you know, hey, hit me up on the email, tell me what you had, tell me what it was like, tell me what challenges you ran into. So the more we know, the better it is. Again, all these vehicles get better and better just because of input and testing. So input from customers, input from firefighters, and also testing of the vehicles with crash testing as well. Yeah. Making a little access there for you. I have there, I assume it's kind of something good like that, apply the dot or anything like that? Uh, no, it works off the cell phone. So, cell phone towers. Okay, so, the kind of time set up inside of the food pipes for the service? Yeah, so, so for vehicle data, uh, Tesla takes care of that. Right. <coughs> so you can't turn that off, like privacy was. There's always going to be data that we're going to be collecting, and the reason for that is we want to know if potentially something's going to happen in the battery pack. So we monitor that pack all the time. Uh, there are times where, yeah, we cannot get to, we cannot get access to the vehicles because the vehicle, I call it, the vehicle has gone dark meaning the vehicle has gone into a parking garage underground or it's in a super remote location where there's no cell towers whatsoever. So when that happens and an accident happens and then people request data from the accident, we may not have data on that incident at all. 
So does that mean that Teslas can't be stolen? Is that a because you you can track the what? Oh no. There's uh yes, Teslas have been stolen, yes. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. We get contacted quite often by law enforcement to locate vehicles and such. Uh, we cannot give out GPS locations on vehicles because we no longer we no, no longer have that data and everything. Uh, we can potentially find out where the vehicle is at when it has an accident because the vehicle does send us send us a signal. But there are times when accidents happen and we have no data on it because just the severity of the accident or where that accident took place at. We, we just don't. We just don't have information available on it. Yeah. So if uh, if police want, if they want information, then we have to go through a subpoena process in order to provide that information. Because yeah, that's it happens quite often. Requesting information. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any remote <coughs> capabilities? What's that? Any remote capabilities? Can you cut off power or, or yeah. uh, isolate the car completely from? No. Tesla home? No. 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 We sure. We do remote unlocks so the customer locks himself out of the car. Roadside assistance can can open their car for them. But there's a whole list of things they have to provide in order for them. Because you know, any Yahoo can just get the bin off the car. <coughs> hey, I locked myself out. Can you let me in? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work that way. Let's talk about firefighting. Firefighting is pretty awesome because uh, we've got firefighters in the room, right? Yeah. All right, so electric vehicle. A little bit different on our firefighting technique that we have. Uh, we're going to have to use a lot more water than we use on a conventional fire, but sometimes you may not have to use a lot more water. Uh, so many variables come into play. But your new friend is your thermal imagery camera, your TIC. All right? Who has TICs on board their vehicles? All right? Pretty much everyone. All right? Don't have one? Hey, have a bake sale and sell some cookies and, and crisps and biscuits and all that good stuff. And uh, make sure you get a camera. Because that thermal imagery camera, that is your that is your way of telling what the battery temperature is. All right, our our firefighting video that we put together, we actually take a Model S, we set it on fire, and we actually put that fire out, and we use that thermal imagery camera to look at it. Now, when there's a fire, a vehicle fire, you potentially could use anywhere from three thousand to four thousand gallons of water. All right, it seems like quite a bit because yeah, it is, but that water, not only are we putting that fire out, we're also cooling that battery pack down. Those cells, they don't like to be warm. So we have a cooling system that works inside that battery to cool the, the temperature down on the cells. Because when cells get hot, they become a little unstable. They get a little nervous. Next thing you know, they blow their top. Smoke's coming out, fire's coming out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, we've done lots of testing on cells. We torture cells all the time because we want to make the best cells possible for our vehicles. The vehicles built in 2012, those cells were pretty awesome at that time. Our new cell technology is even better than that. So all the time, our battery cells get better and better just because of the testing that we do on it. New chemistries come out and we just make them better and better. We have a 100 kilowatt pack out there, so tons of energy available there to allow that vehicle to drive really fast and also the cells are put to the to almost the ragged edge of of their of their potential but to control that we keep everything nice and cool and some of our testing that we've done at 10 percent state of charge on soc it's going to be a low voltage on that cell 18650 we're talking about when you short it out so on top of that cell that have positive and negative, we short that out you're gonna have a little bit of smoke that comes out. That's at 10%. 30%, when we short it out, we're gonna get some smoke that comes out and we see these little tiny bubbles coming out. That's actually electrolyte. All right, get, up, get asked often, hey, you know, what kind of electrolyte we gotta clean up from the side of the road? Yeah, uh, sh shouldn't be really any because the amount of electrolytes in there is very minimal. If you took one of those cells in your hand, you squeezed it really, really hard, got it really hot, and stuff came out, you may get a drop or two, if that, out of there. It's not like big lead acid battery on, on a Toyota forklift, right? 
I came from the uh, Toyota forklift world and everything, so I can definitely relate to those big, heavy electric batteries with lead and acid in them and electrolytes, which make a huge mess when they fall onto the ground. I've seen it happen. So we don't have a massive cleanup like that that's going on. So at 30%, again, a little electrolyte comes out, got a little smoke that comes out. Now 50%, things get a little more exciting. All right, so we short it out. We get some smoke that comes out, get some electrolyte that bubbles. Then we get a little flame that pops out. It's like, oh, cool. Now you're thinking, huh, where does that flame come from? The cool thing about a cell, a lithium ion cell, it is a perfect fire triangle. It creates its own oxygen. So it can be underwater and then it can light off and, and shoot fire out. And it's pretty awesome when it happens. They're also kind of scary depending on how you're looking at it and such. So at 50%, you got a little flame that comes out. 70% state of charge. We have a lot more energy that's available on that. So when it goes, we get some smoke, we get uh, electrolyte, and we get a, a fairly decent flame that comes out of there. Now when we get to 90% state of charge, and we short that out, when we short it out, it's already push, pushing up against it. Anyone do model rockets or anything when they're a kid? Anyone do bottle rockets or anything? Yeah? Uh-huh, cool, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like a big uh, rocket motor going off because it pushes up and then when we pull that plate away, massive fire shoots out of there. Because again, that's a lot of energy that's inside there. We've made it very angry because we shorted it out and it's really hot, so it shoots that fire out. So, state of charge has a lot to do on what the battery pack is gonna do in regards to a vehicle fire. I've seen vehicles with really low SOC, where the vehicle is actually, battery pack has actually hit concrete, taking a big chunk out of the pack, and no vehicle fire whatsoever. I actually worked on that car. There's like a two foot section torn out of that battery pack, two modules completely torn apart, no fire whatsoever. Packs at a very low state of charge, right? And again, we have lots of variables that come into effect on whether or not that vehicle is going to catch on fire. Uh, stationary object, high rate of speed, potentially could have a uh, vehicle fire. Uh, stationary object, high rate of speed, crash into a tree, for example. I've seen trees cut vehicles completely in half, which the tree is extremely powerful and super strong. People don't realize it until that vehicle hits it. And we've had, uh, we've had vehicles that haven't caught on fire, we've had vehicles that have caught on fire. It's gonna happen, all right? Uh, next year, almost every manufacturer got an electric vehicle on the road, and it's going to be super exciting. I'm going to kick back my lazy boy, having a cold one. It's like, oh, wow, look, they just had a vehicle fire and everything. Other manufacturers have vehicle fires, and, uh, but Tesla gets picked on all the time, and we make the news. Hey, it makes us famous and everything. It makes uh, a lot of fear mongers out there, too. Oh, Teslas are dangerous. And everything. No, it's actually a really safe vehicle. We've got what? A, almost a trillion miles on the road with our vehicles and the amount of vehicle fires what well, we haven't had any vehicle fires in Australia so that's awesome and everything uh, in the United States yeah there's been some China there's been some but for the amount of vehicles we have on the road compared to the actual incidents that have happened it's a very very small portion out there so yeah so when these people see the oh the Tesla just burst into flames yeah okay mm-hmm need to do, do a little more research and start looking around and everything. But when that vehicle does catch on fire, we're gonna put that vehicle fire out. We're gonna treat it like any other vehicle fire. We're gonna hit it with the water, knock it down, and then we're gonna use our tick to check out the battery temperature on that. Extremely important to look at that battery temperature. When we're looking at that battery temperature, one thing that we, we're looking for, some people ask, hey, hey what temperature am I looking for? To, you know, to send this vehicle on its way. I like to see ambient temperature, to be honest with you, all right? If I see temperatures that are increasing, that's not a good sign, because if temperatures are increasing, that means we have a stability issue inside the pack, and we need to provide more water. Now, we gotta realize that water is providing a cooling effect. Simple physics going on here. Transfer of heat to cold. So cold water going onto the bottom of the battery pack, that heat that's in the battery pack is then being transferred to the water. So it's actually a very simple process. Just simple physics on that.
So we have our high voltage vehicle firefighting video. We worked with uh, Cal Fire in Ione, California at their big training facility out there. They got 300 plus acres where so they do all kinds of cool stuff. And we asked them, hey, can we burn a car on your facility? And they're like, hey, come on out. Hmm. So yeah, uh, it's actually very green at the time when we did that, so was, uh, back in February. That is a fully functional Model S that we set on fire. So no special pyrotechnics, you know, no uh, newspaper stuffed in there, some gasoline on it or anything. Nope, we took an actual video. Hey, there's me, by the way, hiding there on the little screen. <laughs> yeah. I tend to pop up in the video, sometimes by accident, like that shot was by accident, so. Was that a fire started by shorting the battery or artificially started? Yeah, so we actually used a torch. <coughs> yeah, we used a 400, uh, it was like 40,000 uh, BT <coughs> torch. <coughs> We based it off the NFPA testing process, except uh, we used an entire view. <coughs> yes, this part of the video actually talks about uh, everything that we did, set it on fire. So again, fully functional vehicle. <coughs> there's our torch. On the front of the pack, there is a, there's a little vent opening. And so right there, we put the torch, and that was applying direct heat onto that module right up front. And then eventually the module, it took about 13 minutes for it to get to that point right there. Can you have a lot of plastics that are burning in there? Right here, that's the bottom of the battery pack. So this part of the battery pack is nice and cool, but right here, this is where, that's where our energy is at. That's where our little fire started. And that's uh, said uh, uh, 510 volts. Or sorry, 510 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. 260 Celsius. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay, we knocked down the fire, now we're stabilizing the vehicle. We're uh, raising the vehicle up slightly at an angle so we can gain access to looking at the pack temperature and also applying the water to it. So we're focusing the water flow on that one area How long did they apply it uh, in this instance to get it to back to the ambient? Don't quote me on that. Uh, I know it's in the video on how long it took and everything. Okay. But uh, we wait about five minutes between uh, posing it and then checking it with the camera. Okay. <clears throat> so you mentioned that the plate at the bottom of the vehicle is um, three quarter inch aluminium, 19 mil. Yeah. What's the uh, plate above? Is there any benefit of flooding the um, footwell? No, uh, no, because it's uh, it's actually very thin on top and everything. Um, and and again, most of that heat is going to be concentrated on the bottom. Now, the thing is, every vehicle fire is going to be different. I've seen <coughs> I've seen where the, uh, the 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 fire has been so hot it's actually burned through the floor. I mean, ideally, work in about fifteen minutes of uh, uh, design for that floor to, to <coughs> keep uh, fire from coming through. But again, a lot of that's to do with the, the amount of energy in the accident. The fires that have happened, that they, what sort of causes? Were they, were they mechanical impact or electrical shorting? Yeah, mo most of the ones I've seen have been from mechanical impact, yeah. Yep. <coughs> has there been issues where, uh, where something has gone wrong inside the pack? Yeah. Perfect example, um, if you go onto YouTube, uh, just look up uh, Model S Fire Santa Monica, California, and it should pull up the video. It's actually uh, pretty exciting, and it's pretty cool. I actually, I actually really liked it. And, uh, and what I really liked about it is that it shows the real thing that actually happened. So the person driving the car, someone told him, hey, uh, got some smoke coming out of your Tesla. So they pull over, get out of the car. Of course, people pop out their, their mobile phone. They start videoing because they see smoke coming out. And the vehicle is designed to actually vent smoke along the side of the car. So smoke's coming out, and then all of a sudden we got some fire coming out. So 
And it's shooting out, you know, three, four foot flames. Pretty awesome and everything. I thought it was like, hey, that's super cool. And, you know, and then it begins to die down. And then pop them in there. Got some more. So there's some more cells that are going and such. Now, it'll consume its own energy. And once, once there's nothing else for it to burn, then it just burns itself out. So a lot of times on the vehicles, it's the plastic along the side that ends up catching on fire. And then that transfers to the rest of the vehicle. Or it's really high SOC, and then you, know, you get just tons of energy that catches other pieces of the vehicle on fire. But everything, that, that pack could actually put itself out. It'll really expend that energy. So the fire kind of calmed down, and LA fire truck number eight pulls up to the scene. Firefighters get out, and they get ready to evacuate. And also, it took off again, which was on. So then they grab the fire hose, and then they, they shoot it and everything, and next thing you know, the, the fire is out. Now, coincidentally, I have a friend down there, so I call him up and I say, hey, can you by chance give me the phone number? He's like, yeah, I live right down the street from that firehouse. This is, he's also in the fire department down there, so he gives me the number. I call that captain who was on, who was on charge of that scene. I talk to him that evening, say, hi, my name is Mike McConnell, technical ambassador emergency response with Tesla. And it's like, I want to talk to you about a vehicle fire. He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, I was a little disappointed. All those videos I seen of the cars just engulfed in flames. I roll up and it's a little tiny fire and we just put it out and that's it. It's like, yeah, you got to witness a perfect scenario where it did exactly what it's supposed to do. That battery pack is actually broken up into modules. So those modules that are inside of the battery pack, they're in, in compartments. So they're designed that if one goes, it shouldn't take the others with them. But sometimes that happens. Sometimes you'll have another one that, that catches on fire. I've seen packs completely burned up, and I've seen where just one or two modules have been burned up. I've seen where just one or two cells have been burned up, and it hasn't taken out the whole pack at all. So there's so many variables on it and everything. So yeah, pretty exciting. Yeah, great video. Just pop on YouTube, look it up. Lots of good information there. What are you using for the battery in the Tesla? Like, what, what's the medium? Yes, yes, we're, we're using lithium ion cells on that. Yep. Is there any chance of getting shocked at all using water with such high voltage? No, no, because we've got to remember, those are all individual cells. Yeah. So if I take about 6,000, 9,000 double A's, put them on the floor yeah. and everything, take my feet off, and yeah, let's, I don't know, I'd even try it on the metal plate, get the garden hose out and start hosing everything down. Yeah. A lot of things have to happen in order for that circuit to be completed in order for you to get shocked right. using the water. Because a lot of the time, you know, we get a lot of car fires where people will torture them. It's got nothing to do with the battery underneath. And so you've got the rest of the car burning. Yep. And so there's the opportunity, obviously, for the battery to still be in complete contact. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, in a worst case scenario, is there a chance of it still being able to get shocked? Yeah, we, we've actually seen that example. Right. Uh, there was a Model X that caught on fire, <laughs> and the model completely burned up, but yep. the battery pack was perfectly fine right. on it. Yep. So as long as it's not compromised, then you know we're, then we take that variable out of there. So we don't have that risk. Okay. You know? I see, I, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've yet to see an incident where where, where something like that has actually happened. Because right. we do a lot of testing. We do testing with uh, third parties. We do testing internally. And we, all of our testing, we're, we're making stuff fail because we want to see what happened. You know, mm. Can you get shocked off of this? Can yeah. you, you know, and everything. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we haven't seen that yet. Cutting yeah. through an orange wire that's like, like, you know, there's 400 volts, but there's always going to be a potential. Right, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> it happens at some point if it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, Someone yeah. Do it. Yep, yep. Don't cut through orange wires. Don't cut through uh, the battery pack. Yep, yep. All right, so, so looking at our emergency response sheet, a couple things I'll uh, point out here. Uh, one thing is on stabilizing the vehicle. So you saw in all those videos where they reached in, pushed in on the park button, which is located right there in the stock. On Model 3, in the nose, there is this uh, little round circle 
and when you push at the one o'clock position, that pops it out. That's also an area where the, the tow hook screws in as well. But right there, you have two wires that come out, positive and negative. If you have, if you have a 12 volt jump pack, you can use that to open up the hood, then to gain access to your 12 volt, probably 12 volt power. Right here, we have our first responder loop. We're gonna do a double cut on that. The reason why I do a double cut is to keep from potentially those wires coming back and touching on that. And again, on model three, where is that first responder loop located at? Bastard sign, that's correct. Model S and X, where is that located at? Yeah. Let's take a look at our guide. All right, so our emergency response guide, 33 page document on average. Uh, we have these for all of our vehicles, the S, the X, and 3. Also the different years as well where there's differences on the vehicle. So we like to change things on the vehicle as we go. Badging, super important for identifying the vehicle. Tesla T located on the front and the rear of the vehicle. So that's the Tesla T that we're talking about. Model S will have, uh, potentially have Model S and also what the uh, what the, what the battery is, is an uh, example of P90D. Side markers will have a Tesla T on them as well. Also center cap of the wheel as well. And again, it can be all smashed up and not have any of that left on the vehicle. Touch screen, we've got that big center touch screen. Also a nice uh, instrument cluster there. Those are again, identifying features of the vehicle. Model 3 has its own little touchscreen that kind of floats out there on a pedestal. Our high voltage component location is on the vehicle. High voltage battery location. DC, DC. Here we have the layout of the high voltage cables. A, this is our uh, charger underneath the back seat. Here's a high voltage cable going to our charge port. Now, in that charge port, only time high voltage will be present there is when we're actually charging that vehicle. And we've done all kinds of testing to try to back feed through there, but we've, we've yet to try to, we've yet accomplished that. So, again, only time power is going to be there is when we're actually plugging that vehicle in for charging. High voltage cables going to the drive inverter <coughs> on the drive unit, then high voltage. Cables running through that sill, coming up to the front DC DC high voltage junction box, and then up to our front drive unit. As far as the battery fires, um, are they kicking off when the vehicle's been driven normally, or back at home in the garage on charge? Or what? Uh, there's there's various incidents. You know, we we've had we, we've we've had both. We've had accidents. Uh, we've had where stuff inside the vehicle is caught on fire but it hasn't been a battery fire. And that's super important when looking at the vehicle to determine, was it a battery fire or was it something else that caught on fire? And the home, so if they've got a home charging port, it's obviously there'll be some sort of shutdown at the switchboard or something like that? Yeah, all of them have a circuit breaker that can be shut off and everything, yeah. Yeah. It's easier to figure out how to put the steering wheel on the opposite side versus rerouting all of the high voltage cable. Because then we'd have to build completely different cars mm. on the you assembly line. The came on one side of the fuel regardless. Are you, are you, are you turning, you're not turning the motors on there, you're just moving the steering wheel. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the, the rack is also different on, yeah. on the car as well. Model 3, though, we changed up a little bit because all the high voltage cable just runs on the bottom side of us right along the center of the battery pack. So it no longer runs on one side or the other. So it's, it's a lot more simplified. Yep. 
Yeah, it was one of those things, you know, we built it in America first, and we're like, huh, how do we make this for other countries? <laughs> yeah. There we have a picture of the first responder loop, and again, we'll show that on the vehicles outside. Showing the location of all the airbags. On the, the seats, they do have the, uh, the side bolts, bolster airbag, or sometimes called the kidney bag. Sometimes people put seat covers over them, and those seat covers are not designed for airbags opening on the side. So sometimes you'll have an airbag <laughs> failure because they put a seat cover over it, and things happen. Like the Tesla's generator, even they're going downhill and breaking. Yeah, we have regen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so with regen, with the regen, we're actually putting uh, happy electrons back into the battery pack. Yeah. Is it perpetual energy, which would be totally awesome? <laughs> no, unfortunately, it's not. Yeah. Actually, a friend of mine back in the roaster days, he did a calculation and he figured out the the inclined plane, how long it had to be, and how many miles what the speed was to actually get enough enough mileage back into it. So yeah. That was actually before we had beers. <laughs> I told him, hey man, hey, let's go get a beer after that. That's like too heavy for me. Airbag inflation cylinders. Seat belt pretensioners I just spoke about. And again, these guys are also available for Model X, also Model 3. Here we have a vehicle in the swimming position. <laughs> All right. We do have customers that like to take their vehicles into the water because they love their car so much. They want to take it to the beach, take it swimming with them. Some of them think that it's, it's James Bond's car, so they're going to go under, underneath the water with it. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's because of an accident has happened. Uh, sometimes that water they go into is a salt water mix, which potentially uh, provides a lot of challenges when that vehicle comes out. Uh, fresh water, fresh water seems to uh, uh, not provide as many challenges. Again, a lot of it is it determines upon whether or not water has gotten into the battery pack on that. We have seen where vehicles have gone into salt water, come out of salt water, and then an incident has happened. Uh, there's been flood vehicles where incidents have happened. So the uh, the very very first Model S that was involved in a flood. Uh, we nicknamed her Sandy from Hurricane Sandy. She had water that went up to my chest if I was sitting into it. And I was, was in there in New York City. That vehicle was in a parking garage underground. Uh, vehicle got taken out and then transported that vehicle from New York City out to California. We took it completely apart and we checked out the battery pack and we had no water in the battery pack whatsoever. So we we're super excited about that. Yeah, car got rebuilt, used as a training vehicle, and her nickname was Sandy. So a lot of variables uh, with uh, vehicles going in underwater. Uh, there was one accident where a vehicle went underwater. It went about uh, 15 feet down <coughs> underwater. Uh, unfortunately, the driver did not make it. And it's the rescue teams, they spent about eight hours trying to get that vehicle out of that water. It was at night. Uh, zero visibility, and also it was deep, rugged terrain, underwater, and the vehicles are very heavy. There's a lot of weight to those vehicles. Again, on these vehicles, make sure you check out the little stickers on the door. Uh, real drive Model S, you're looking at around, uh, right around about 4,650 pounds or so. Uh, Model X, GVW, is close to about 7,000 pounds. Uh, dual motor Model S is 6,000 some pounds. So yeah, uh-huh, it sure is, yes. Yeah, I didn't eat enough uh, Wheaties to bench press that, yes. <laughs> and so when that vehicle gets underwater, it fills with water, that's gonna add some additional challenges to it. So the challenges, because uh, it's really neat, because after that accident happened, the, the, the captain in charge of that incident, he sent me a nice long email to talk all about it and some of the challenges they ran into. Uh, one challenge they had, they hooked up uh, one of their airbags to one of the wheels, wheel was actually cracked, and it broke the wheel off, so that, that was, you know, scrapped that idea. So uh, they also hooked up to one of the C-pillars, and it actually tore through on a C-pillar, but the B-pillars are extremely strong, so they were able to finally hook up on that, get the vehicle to its position where they finally hook up the tow cables underneath, and then they brought the vehicle finally up 
to top side up on ground or anything. And that vehicle did not catch on fire on that, even though it was submerged completely under, underwater. So a lot of variables can happen on that. We have to pick, be prepared for everything. But just confirming when you say cool by applying water directly to the battery, that must be from underneath, ideally, the vehicle has to be in a position where you can get water underneath. Yes, that's that's the ideal position, yeah. Yep. And then when it comes to uh, to storage of the vehicle afterwards, once we've determined, all right, temperatures are stable, we can now transport this vehicle, whatever storage site it goes to, we want to keep about 50 feet away from other vehicles or anything else that potentially is flammable, we want to monitor for about 24 hours to make sure uh, reignition does, does not occur. Reignition can happen on any electric vehicle, and it probably will happen to any electric vehicle out there. Other manufacturers, they do have, have electric vehicle fires. So they don't just get advertised as much because Tesla's awesome, and <coughs> whether it's good news or bad news, yeah, we get to, we get to see it. So. So is there any risk of the explosion with the batteries or just real violent burning? Real violent burning, yeah. Yeah, that's why we, again, we do all this testing on the packs and everything. And because when those cells do discharge, if they don't have a way to vent someplace, yeah, it'll build up gas inside there. And that enclosure, yeah, it'll, it'll blow, blow, <coughs> blow up and, and bubble up and stuff. Uh, that's why we build vents into it so that it has some place to go. Yeah. Any incidents of thermal runaway in factory packs? Uh, that has happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we investigate all that stuff. So whenever there is a, any, any vehicle fire out there, 99% uh, of the time we're going to send someone to check it out. I work with individuals and we look at that stuff quite often. I've looked at That's several studies. What's that? That's in the studies. What about here in Australia? Uh, we have we haven't had a fire yet, so uh, yeah, okay. not, knock on wood and stuff. Uh, Europe, we have individuals over there in Europe that investigate vehicle fires and everything, so yeah. Because uh, we also investigate, see if maybe there's arson. So it may have nothing to do with the vehicle, mm -hmm. but someone created it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in that situation, if we've got a fire, the fire's been extinguished, vehicles in storage, and somebody gets sent out like me, Yep. Apart from what we've talked about here, yep. are there any other precautions I should be taking? Yeah, uh, don't don't touch any high voltage cables. You know, if you tell it was an orange cable, yep. Uh, super important, bring your multimeter. Okay, when, uh, when I was teaching service technicians about our vehicles, I always had a saying, when in doubt, whip it out and check it out. Pull my multimeter up, yeah. Your multimeter is your friend. Uh, when we go out and we check a vehicle that's been on fire or anything, we want to check to see if the pack is isolated, to the pack itself, or maybe uh, chassis to ground. Yeah, we got our high voltage gloves on, we got our multimeter out, and we're checking pack to ground. We'll check many positions and everything to see if we read anything. Are there any guards on that? Or any no. No? No, there aren't on that. Or is it a situation if I'm asked to look at one, I contact you and say, where do I go? Yeah, hit me up at first responder safety at tesla.com. Cool. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the best place to start. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is it a consideration that we should have a pending a motor vehicle accident with person trapped where the car is mechanically impacted and signs that the battery may have been compromised? Should we be checking the multimeter to see if the car is alive? No, nah, it shouldn't be necessary on that. Yeah. What, why is that different? Why, why is why, that? So why don't we need to do it at an MBA? We do need to do it after it's been sitting there for a while. Yeah, because that one there, the vehicle's caught on fire. So so the so lots of things are lots of things are different on it. Yeah. So okay, worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. You get there and uh, for some reason it is live. What do you do? <laughs> Never experienced that. Give me a call, cause uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, yes. Yeah. I've, I've never experienced it. We never experienced it with a vehicle. Okay. Yeah. It's a fair sort of thing because, but you would hope that the contactors. I don't know about the size of the car, 
Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, you know, you know in, the, in the vehicle crash and everything, lots of things happen in uh, contactors they try to open and everything. Does it have like an over voltage protection built in? Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I, know. Yeah. I, don't know. Like, yeah. Yeah. I had a few questions, now about 100,000 questions. Oh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. It's really got one one bottling. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it's it's actually a very complicated vehicle. Yeah. And there's there's lots of safety stuff that even, even I don't really know about. I'm still learning on the vehicle. I've been working on the vehicle since 2010. Mm. So, yeah. Yep. And then we always design more and more into it as well. Just to throw in, like, like I, I think I know what you guys are uh, sort of attacking out there. So you've got a, got a car that you're turning up to that's been in an accident that uh, somehow hasn't deployed air bags. Um, that, so I, I'll give you one um, that we had a little while back. Uh, it was a vehicle that a uh, guy come over a set of uh, railway tracks, and he landed. Uh, he landed so hard, he had torn the front suspension back. Somehow it didn't deploy air bag. Um, smashed back, and it was uh, one of the early uh, model S's, so it had the DC-DC up front, so the cables sort of wrapped around. It pinched those cables. So this is while its contactors are on. Um, it, there were signs of arcing. We could see that it had shorted to the ground there. But in that case, um, the contactors, uh, they opened in the pack. One they, it was, yeah, one opened, one welded, one opened. Uh, and then we had the pyro tubes, so the fuse within the pack as well. Um, that blew. So there was nothing outside the pack. So that was a dead short while the vehicle was, was running um, through the cables. So there's a heap of safeties in there that will stop that vehicle being aligned. <coughs> mm. So that's cool if you're negative ground, but what about your other system you were talking about? Floating ground? Mm -hmm. No, this was both cables. This yeah. was yeah. Floating <coughs> both. 400 cables and shorted against a bar. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Still, so it's completely circuit. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the contact is tried to open and melted one of them, like it arced across it, the other one got open, <coughs> but in the process of blowing the tubes. So that was like safeties on safeties on safeties. Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. Other manufacturers, they get our vehicles and they take them apart and they try to replicate us, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> In, in what's really awesome about it is that is that if they can actually replicate our battery pack, then it's going to be safe for everyone out there. But other manufacturers they haven't quite figured out our magic sauce. Yeah. It's like when I go to Outback Steakhouse and everything. You probably heard about that famous uh, Australian restaurant in America, Outback Steakhouse. They got this thing called the Bloomin' Onion, and the Bloomin' Onion it is this amazing thing of deep fried deliciousness and. <laughs> On uh, late, late hours on TV, you, you can find the, the Bloomin' Onion Maker, so you can make it yourself. You're like, oh, I need to go back to Outback Steakhouse. You know, I can have my Fosters at home, and I can make my own Bloomin' Onion. <laughs> so I make that Bloomin' Onion, and then I'm like, how do I make this Bloomin' Sauce? <laughs> so it's that secret sauce that makes that Bloomin' Onion taste so delicious. It's that secret sauce in our cars that make them, makes them so awesome. But you found the bosses in Australia, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, don't worry, I, I, I've been told we don't drink that stuff here. No, 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 no. There, yeah. uh -huh. Maud, have you had any um, incidences <coughs> with extreme ambient air temperature and long exposure to that? Like with our really hot summer heat wave days, yeah. things like that. I know California, you get your hot. Yeah, your hot I, so I can have the, the local. Talk about that, yeah. yeah. So, as you did the lot of thermal, so we have thermal test chambers and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, I went over to the Middle East last year, so I've lived over there for nine years. I uh, went back with Tesla. We had uh, a couple of days there sitting at 55 degrees, um, and we went out and abused this car. Um, some of the cool stuff we've got in there. Um, so, our batteries are not only cooled by ambient air temp, they're also cooled by the air conditioning. So we can divert what we call to the, the chiller, so we run the AC, um, it'll be caught inside the car, but also be running to the chiller. So we'll loop coolant, which is basically in contact with every single cell in the battery. So uh, yeah, like Michael talked about before there, the each of the batteries is we kind of run coolant in between them, uh, through like really thin tubes. Um, that regulates the temperature of the battery. So even though it's a 55 you know, plus degree day outside on in the middle of a mountain climb, um, we're running that AC, we're calling the battery, we're calling the drivetrain. Um, so it doesn't 
really matter that much for us. I did it where we got down to negative three percent SOC, as in we were creeping into the supercharger. Um, so the battery pack was the worst possible scenario. It was up around sort of sixty degrees, and then we plugged it into the supercharger and we said, "Okay, here's all these electrons. Have fun." And uh, the software and the way the car ran, um, it would sort of control the the ramp up of current into the pack um, until the you know, the AC could catch up to chill the pack enough, and then say, "Now we're really going to start feeding it in." So high ambient temp isn't really a big problem for us. Is there, sorry, is there potential for that cooling system to leak or those sources? It's like any man-made problem, really. Not yeah, sure, but, but I mean, um, if you've got a radiator and hoses and stuff like that, or something like that. Yeah, but you've got uh, like a lot of um, a lot of checks in our systems. Yeah. So um, going into the tech side of it a little bit here. Um, in a typical like standard internal combustion engine vehicle, you have to be used to things like diagnostic trouble codes. You know, they bring up engine light. We have things that are called alerts, um, and they are what happens before an actual failure happens. So we'll be logging these sorts of faults in there. If we've got an error with the cooling system, so we've got some sort of pinhole leak or something, it'll come up and say, you know, a bit more than the coolant level low, it'll be contact Tesla or, you know, goes a bit further with it. So, and yes, you can. Yeah, we also don't have a radiator cap either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a blasted cap, but yeah, it's not a pressurized radiator cap. Yeah. Nope. Um, I'm currently looking at fires in the waste recycling stream, and we're getting a lot of fires from lithium batteries. Yep. Have you got a life cycle policy so your batteries come back to you? So if that vehicle's involved in an accident and it goes off in a low loader, that's coming back to you? Yeah, I like to touch on that. Yeah, so we're working, I'm working with a, uh, with a group uh, over in Europe and we're putting policies together for Europe for end-of-life vehicles. And so does Australia also have end-of-life vehicle program as well? There's nothing police. So the, okay. the, the, the only incentive is there's a nice warm feeling that somebody does something at the moment. Gotcha, gotcha, there gotcha. needs to be a financial incentive or something to bring it back to the manufacturer. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so cool. So it's kind of like here in the United States, same thing. Yeah. It's like we don't have, because in the States we want we want to try to do something about that. But again, we don't actually own the vehicle, the customer owns it. Yeah. So yeah, so it'd be nice for the customer to say, hey, I'm done with this battery pack. Can you please dispose of it properly? Yeah, because otherwise it ends up in sort of at the back of some car yard metal recycler, yeah. which is then a, we get a lot of metal recycling fires. Yeah. And then we've got a fuel yeah. source that we're not expecting. Right, because then they end up going into with a claw and like grabbing it out or whatever. and yeah. That's happened in the States as well. Yeah. Mainly because a lot of the fluff gets catches fire and then everything catches fire. Correct. And yeah. so it's an unknown element yeah. for firefighters actually yeah. responding to those fires. Yeah, so the answer to that question right now, no, no. We, we don't we don't have a system in place on that. So is there special handling in a tow yard after twenty four hours when it's deemed not to be a continuation of the fire event? What happens with the handling? Because the tow is a very ungentle with these machines when they're moving yeah, I've seen good things and bad things happen. So I've seen where the vehicle is, ends up, you know, being fine. But we always got to remember that battery still always has energy potential in it, and it takes a long time for that battery to actually to actually discharge itself. And what is that time frame? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, no, so no, I'm just curious. Yeah, right, right. 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 Like, so, so, so uh, uncompromised Model S battery pack just sitting there. So when we have one in storage in a crate, we lose, what, 
one percent a month, something like that, approximately. Yeah. So, so if it's at, uh, let's say it's at fifty percent SOC, it would take fifty months for that to go down to zero percent SOC. So effectively, there is an ongoing threat, effectively, from that machine. Yeah. Just through rough handling. There was a, there's an auction house back in the United States where uh, a wrecked Model X was there, and it was an insurance company auction, and yeah, and they had this big massive forklift, and they picked it up, and they poked a hole in the battery pack, and yeah, caught on fire, fire department shows up, and, and they're putting water on it. So yeah, so it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new thing in the big picture, so we're constantly learning, uh, next year, all the other manufacturers are going to have vehicles on the road. So the next 10 years is going to be a big learning for all of us to really try to figure out, hey, what are we going to do with this new technology that's available? And again, you know, just like you said, yeah, reach out to us and everything. And, and yeah, we would love to help, help put a plan together for that. And, so, and again, it's, you know, again, it goes back on education, too. So, you know, working with the tow yards and everything, educating them about the vehicles and potential risks involved with them and everything. But, yeah. yeah, in the States, obviously, there's a lot more of these. You've had them a lot longer. Is there yeah. a, a, a business gen being developed of recycling the lithium? Are, the, uh, do people, are people interested in taking that for a financial gain? Or is there yeah, yeah, so, so there are some recycling companies in place. Uh, all of our engineering vehicles, we take the battery packs out of those. All the vehicles we cut up, and do training the first responders. We pull all the packs out, we strip them all down, and then we, re we recycle all of that and everything. There are, there are companies that are starting up that are doing that as well. So yeah, so there is something something in place. And it's, it's interesting, you know, on eBay, because uh, you know, we we would love to get all of our battery packs back so we can recycle them and then uh, make more awesome stuff with it. But there's a great market on eBay for our battery packs and people are selling modules and everything. So, so yeah, so not a lot of recycling going on there, but a lot of selling, buying, and trading of those. You don't have any sort of identification chips or anything to actually track track them if they come through and they, they're going elsewhere and being inappropriately used, perhaps? Well, uh, circuit boards, they'll have, they'll have numbers and stuff on them. Okay. But yeah, there's no enough, sort of, I mean, you know, if yeah, something- like a, like a dog identification chip. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, so we know, we know what battery pack it came out and that kind of stuff. So we keep a lot of detailed information on that. Yeah. Jim? What would a replacement pack battery be worth? Like just out of interest. What? Oh, I, I've seen complete packs on eBay for about uh, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I've seen individual modules go from eight hundred to a thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. Yeah. There's no potential to use the Tesla vehicle instead of a power wall so not yet not yet yeah yeah, yeah a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people have asked about that like, yeah how can you know the power goes out how can i use my my vehicle and stuff <laughs>